It's, it's same it's as good. Okay. Hi everybody. Um, apologies about that. I'm hoping that you all got the connection. Andrew, talk. Let's just see if we can hear you talk. Hey Adam. Hey everyone. Excellent. Is that working? We can hear you. It's looking like we can hear you. So that looks nice. like that's fantastic. Love that. <laughs> but I'm not sure that I can see you now. This is really annoying. Let's just Ooh. see if. Um, can't see myself. I can see you, so that's all right. Let's just transition across to you. That's even better. <laughs> How's your day Great. been? Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Combination of things. Yep. Yeah. I'm sure everyone now prep. can hear him. So if you can't hear, please just let us know. <laughs> um, now, Andrew, I'm going to do a bit of an intro to you to get it started, and I'm going to check that you can. Um, do your slides um, so in the background so we try and get that going so if you want to um, transition across to your slide that'd be awesome um, do a screen share a screen share yeah you can screen share and just get your slides ready and I'll just give a bit of intro for everyone who doesn't know Andrew Andrew has a practice based here in Sydney um, I think he's an exceptional architect we get to work each together on projects which is um, beyond fantastic actually for me. It's really enjoyable working with Andrew. He has an ability to make beautiful architecture and make the complex things feel not complicated. He celebrates the complexity through making it incredibly, incredibly beautiful and incredibly simple um, and always delivers buildings which I think add um, delight and joy to our lives. So Andrew, over to you and I, um, I'm gonna change a little bit because I quite enjoyed um, with Lee and Ashley the other night having a bit of a chat during the during the whole presentation. So if you don't mind, we might chat a little bit as we go along. I that would be great. Fun, and I figure yep. I'm doing it, so I may as well, you know, enjoy it a little bit. <laughs> no, do it, mate. Do it. Do it. Um, well, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Adam, so much for the invitation to talk. Really exciting, and for putting on this series, um, and for running the bookshop, and for the opportunity to collaborate with you. Um, I think, yeah, I think you have a huge role um, and you add so much to the architectural culture in our city. So that's really awesome. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I call this talk, call this talk a little less, a bit less simple. Um, and I guess I just want to sort of highlight how, some of the evolution, the way um, we've been thinking about architecture over a little while. It's an interesting time. I guess people have found being in this sort of isolation phase, um, it's a bit of a time to reflect and a bit of a time to think through, um, to remember things. You remember things. You find, I've been finding, I've been recalling a lot of things given the limitation of um, other stimulus. Um, before I go on, I should say, um, also just to, just to sort of acknowledge my, my partner, Hannah, who's been incredibly patient with me through... Um, well, through the entirety uh, of the time that I've known her. Um, anyway, so a bit less simple. I wanted to, just want to show how the thinking's been evolving, and um, uh, I say I say a bit less simple. It's not a it's not a dramatic transformation of the thinking. It's just the projects that we've been doing have become a little larger, um, and I've found that where some of my initial approach was very much about the apparently simple form, the sort of ambiguous object that maybe was so apparently dramatically simple that it could hold multiple readings, um, you know, informed by by people like Olgiati or some of David Ajay's early work. Um, and I, I guess I've found in starting to do larger projects and, and just starting to maybe loosen a little bit, um, I've tried to bring in more, more influences and a little bit more diversity, more uh, sort of inclusive, collaborative approach where projects might get a little bit more layered. Um, so rather than sort of re re reducing and removing uh, sort of legibility, to bring a little bit of legibility in that can just create ways of coming into a project. So, but again, it's only a bit less simple. All the things that I value, um, really, you'll probably see continuity through the project. So this sort of working definition of architecture, which, which I've found very just very useful. So architecture is materials arranged according to geometry to accommodate life. And I think if a, a project is successful, if there's a, a comprehensive investigation into each of those things, materials, geometry, and life, 
ideally in a way that they're um, integrated and mutually reinforcing to the extent that there's no redundant content. I think that's where the project's really happening. So that's something that kind of goes through all the, the projects. Um, so I'll show a series of projects from um, some of the, I guess, more foundational ones and to try to sort of create a thread through to some of the other ones. But um, I will talk. So, Adam, you need to jump in at any point. because That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first project, Australia House, which was a very um, important project for us, loca located in um, Japan, in Niigata. Um, it was a design competition. This is actually eight years ago. Um, a lot of times passed. Um, so it's up in the up near the near the coastline, the Japan Sea, just sort of set at the foot of the mountains. So you can imagine you get this this huge. Um, can you see my mouse, my cursor? Yeah, we can see your cursor, and you're getting a bit of yeah. um, okay. reverb from your microphone scratching against your fantastic jumper. Oh. So just don't scratch um, too much. <laughs> um, so located at the foot of the mountains. Um, the Japan Sea, so the winds can blow down cold wind from Siberia carrying snow. So you get this huge potential snowfall events. Um, this was a design competition um, for a gallery um, artist in residence location for the Australian government. There was a building um, just nearby here that as an old farmhouse that the Australian government had purchased and, and Australian artists were travelling to and doing residencies to participate in a, um, a festival, the Ichigo Tsumari Art Triennale, which is a great um, a sort of community-engaged art festival um, up, yeah, a few hours north of Tokyo, run by a guy from Kitigawa. He also runs Satuchi down on um, Nanashima Island. So he's like, he's like the guy of community-engaged participatory art. Um, and Austra Australian artists have, have been very well represented. So... The building um, came down the day after 3.11, the earthquake, and an aftershock, um, as they call the, the earthquake over there. So uh, the Australian government resolved to build a new building. Um, from the launch of the competition to the completion of construction was 11 months. So super tight yeah. time frame, um, which, which had a whole lot of implications for the, the architectural design, the structural design, and um, the detailing, et cetera. Um, it's located at this sort of bend in a road, so you get this kind of gradual reveal to the structure, and it's uh, triangular in form. Landscape is very um, picturesque, um, so it really is a mountainous context, kind of mountain down to sort of mountain rural threshold. Um, your jumper, Andrew. As much as I love a good jumper, it's becoming a little bit um, fuzzy. <laughs> I don't know if you could just hold your microphone away from your jumper a little okay. bit. Okay. Tell me if that. Tell me if that's like. That's is that much, any better? That's much better. Okay. Perfect. I might just get this little guy over here. Um, so Brett Boardman came up and took photographs of the building when we completed, but we also just documented the various structures around the area. We were taken by these um, small rural sheds, uh, often located adjacent to the road, invariably located adjacent to the road, often with steep roofs falling towards the road so that you would shed snow um, towards the road where the authorities would move that snow onwards, as opposed to shed it, shedding it onto your own property. Um, so this, yeah, really kind of creative um, catalog of um, micro steeply pitched architecture. Um, I wanted to sort of, in the design co concept, I wanted to respond to that, the kind of idea of a, of a abstracted rural, simple rural form, but then subjecting it to a simple transformation, in this case, a diagonal slice so as to create this um, triangular form. Um, and that becomes this kind of compressed object um, with a tectonic interior, um, expressed structure, um, and a complexity within a simple form. So, so again, the thing of an apparently simple form, but that holds um, an internal spatial complexity. So arriving at this long veranda space, um, coming into a long gallery, um, the tall gallery with this this post by Koku Bashira, um, and then the wide gallery which spreads out onto the opens onto the adjacent landscape. So these three kind of triangular building, three spaces, long, tall, wide. Um, collaborated with um, to deliver the project some Japanese architects, um, uh, Atelia Imamu, um, who um, did a fantastic. 
uh, set of construction and detailed documentation. Yeah, absolutely precise. Um, made the project what it is. And you sort of had to see the side before you went there, before you won the competition. No, no. Oh. So it was designed from um, from Google. There was a, a big change in the design, actually. The the triangle, we sort of had to flip it in the other direction to do that thing of shedding the snow. Um, we had a meeting with the local community, um, which was absolutely fascinating. I I, um, I started my presentation by, it was in the evening, and I started by my presentation by saying to everyone, good morning. Um, <laughs> I say I had <laughs> no idea of it. It sort of broke the ice. <laughs> um, so you can see the simple form, upper level. Um, actually, I mean, a, a triangular geometry, um, my kind of rationale was that it created a long wall in the gallery. Um, so for a, a gallery space of um, created this excess excess dimension um, that you wouldn't ordinarily get, you wouldn't get that dimension in a, a, a square, a space of equal mm. floor area. So it was trying to, it's a very small building. It's like 140, 145 square meters. That's tiny. Um, so trying to get like length and extension, height, length, um, and breadth. Um, the little building on that approach from the road. So you do, you do because of that that kind of geometric transformation, you do get these um, different perceptions. Um, it sort of sits up on this little retaining wall, um, and you get a, you you get a view through into the interior just to sort of get a sense of um, a sense of that. Um, a triangular geometry creates these 45 degree, uh, it's an equilateral triangle, creates these 45 degree edges, which means that from certain orientations, you don't see the second wall. So you get this kind of absolutely piercing um, geometry. We wanted to actually just do a, a really simple forecourt, just not just a gravel um, forecourt to sit this building onto it, a plinth. Um, I think to, I like to try to, um, I think certain sort of architectural moves and architectural strategies have um, associations with a kind of institutional quality. It, it kind of raises, elevates the tone, the intent of the project. And I think, I think when you do that, it, it and, and they're almost classical devices. Often, um, you know, it's the idea, the idea of a, of a forecourt that presents a building, sets space in front of a building. Uh, it's a classic move to generate. Um, yeah, a sense of significance. So, that, and that through that significance, you can perhaps extend the the mission of the client or the project. Yeah. Um, so here you do get this kind of absolute frontality. I love um, this. Thing. I love this facade of this building. So simple, so simple. There's actually, I don't have, I don't have it in, um, I don't have the photographs here, but they've they've been, um, they've been, uh, fashion shows oh, wow. on this uh, on this veranda. There've been dance performances. Um, there was an artist in residence who was a, a, a choreographer, choreographer dancer who um, developed a performance based on the the building. Um, all sorts of things. So it's kind of this this idea of uh, a thing, a building which is like quite autonomous, but actually in a way quite precise and site specific. Like both of those things at the same time, kind of equally. That also stimulates maybe a way of making art. Um, uh, that that also has a kind of precision with response to its landscape um, or its setting, um, and and in response to the building. Although I, something I discovered through this this building is um, the kind of the, the sort of creative responses that artists and residents would have, you wouldn't predict them. Um, yeah. You know, so it's that it's that thing. There's a different kind of criticality at play, I think, in a, in an artist practice, um, which I find really really fascinating. Um, I'll show Brooke Andrews' work that. Um, that we we permanently installed. Um, so it's a sort of dark palette in the evening, um, and then that darkness gives way to a the sort of honey coloured interior. You can see at the end of the end of the of the hall there the, the, the king post, the Daiko Kubishira, um, that sort of shields the light. It's the passion fruit moment. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah, cut the Absolutely. outside, see the see the joy and the beauty of the interior. It's gorgeous. I figured with this project that since we would we would not have much um, you know a huge amount of involvement during construction it was so short I thought just make a simple rule everything inside just honey coloured timber mm. everything externally black you know or dark dark stained mm. and 
where possible, every fitting black inside and out. There's like three three rules and like whatever happens, it's going to be like sort of through that kind of material continuity, you get an emphasis on the, the form, um, the form and volume and sort of um, plasticity as opposed to detail. Um, because you sort of want to want to suppress that stuff. That stuff is all there in the service of the larger idea. Um, you know, so you do get these just very simple. This is actually a whole in the end of the in the end of the round because we we could fill this. Um, there's these sort of little slots you can just see there. We could stack these kind of boards down there to get um, to protect the veranda from snow. When you do get huge snowfall here, but this meant then at the end of in the end they would cut in the winter they cut a little passage here and that's how you get into the building. Oh, yeah. um, they access it through the winter, so they're kind of yeah dealing with that um, climatic condition. Um, so then the passion fruit moment, um, that kind of veranda that that resonates with the the trees. Um, and you start to get the sense of the other spaces throughout. And Andrew, is it the same timber, just charred on the outside and non-charred on the inside? It's it's actually not charred externally. It's a stain. Oh wow! Uh, I'm sorry to uh, demystify that. I always assumed it was that. charred. We did a charred building. I'll show you in a second. <laughs> um, but the the proportion, I think, this is like 4.2 meter high veranda space that. Mm. But it just feels good. It feels like, um, yeah, it, feel, it just has a kind of scale. You come up the top, um, and you can see the king post coming through the the view through, and you get this view down through to the the lower, um, the tall gallery. You can see those um, steel sort of posts, steel beams spanning across, which were about having the potential built in for some suspended artworks. So there's this other kind of fairly some of it more subtle than that infrastructure through the building to accommodate other other types of works installation in future and you get these little bunks so it's a there's accommodation up top these six little um kind of la tourette moment i don't know what happened to the window for this guy that um <laughs> but yeah so it's a it's a place that artists or a small group can stay at um it also functions as an emergency shelter for the area so if in the event of a of a high um, a potential earthquake or a, a high, the design criteria was to withstand an 8.5 um, earthquake, which is major, with a um, 3.5 tons of snow, uh, tons per square meter of snow on the roof. Wow. So it's a major design criteria. So the triangular triangle is actually very sort of inherently rigid as a geometry. Um, sort of the planes kind of push um, onto one another. Um, and then you get this view down from the top through to the, the tall gallery. Um, the builder um, on a Jima construct on a Jima san who had owned all the land around the property was very keen for this project to proceed, um, and was then then the builder. But he offered offered the the the, the king post was almost was actually the one element that was value engineered out of the project. And then at one point we got this photograph through with from him with a a photograph of this tree he was proposing to give to the project. To complete the concept, it was a, it was a beautiful um, gesture, and you get just these like pragmatic spaces, a little kitchen tucked up there. But the, that you can see that landscape, that threshold from the rural through mm. um, to a more mountainous condition. Um, we were really fortunate to work with Brooke Andrew, um, who's I think you know he's one of the most fascinating artists in the country probably internationally um and um we're, we're a jury man with a a great um sort of critical practice um yeah i guess interrogating and challenging kind of colonial ideas but in a very playful way often um so he's got i think he's got a powerful practice but we we talked about um what might be a way of embedding a work permanently in the space and this kind of dialogue started about reflections. He'd actually seen an early rendering of the project of the main gallery space, and I'd, I'd put a kind of artwork externally and internally just to suggest the gallery, the, the landscape as part of the um, gallery. And, and he had interpreted it as a reflection. So suddenly this idea of reflection came into the discussion, and then um, 
he liked all the sort of folding shutters and pocket sliding doors and things and wondered if we could do a shut a folding kind of element in the building mm -hmm. so we developed this large um 500 kilogram panel um that as as big as we could actually fortunately we could just fit it on here on this this orientation to locate a, a permanent work into the space um which you can see here in the open so it's a sort of a mirror with a, then a neon work um on um brooks distinctive um, pattern um he wrote a poem with the local community um see my snow see my summer crop see my jade river see my mountain ancestors see my children see my struggle see me with clarity drink tea with me um he spent time there and um the 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 message what he came to understand from the local community was that they really valued being part of this art tree gnarly, but they found that people were coming for like, you know, half an hour and then moving on. So they wanted actually to form relationships um, to sort of broaden their their community um, to the world as they as they saw it. So Brooke wrote this poem collaboratively. Um, and then the poem is written in Kanji text, but backwards. Um, and so you can only read the poem in the mirror which is on the second panel. And when you read the, um, so then that sort of mirrors the landscape. So you'll read the, the poem while you're reading the poem, you're seeing the landscape and you're seeing yourself in the landscape. Mm. Um, like it was, that was, that was just a, a moment for me of <clears throat> coming to an understanding of, um, the absolute potential for conceptual precision in contemporary art practice. Cause it's not sort of, Feeling in architecture were often buttressed by, you know, client program, um, site response to all those things. You can respond to all those things in a diligent way and make a project. But in a in an art practice, you sort of set the rules of the game. Um, you you it's sort of both essential but non-essential. Um, it's kind of deeply essential. Um, so that situation, I think, to have a yeah, have a, a a sustained art practice that investi an investigation to sustain that. You need clarity, um, conceptual clarity. And I think Brooke showed that in this work. Um, when the when the panels open, it also creates these other sort of spatial conditions in the gallery. You can also close it close it down, and then you've got a, a more neutral space. Um, just put this this photograph in. So I worked for Nisa Merkett for. Um, quite a few years after university and this was I didn't work on this project but this was Nick's um, box house um, down the south coast and um, I always thought this was just a great project and I mean I think that I think the work that um, Nisa and Merck are doing now is absolutely spectacular and um, but yeah this was an, an early one um, it's like I think 6.2 by 6.2 by 5.4 four meters tiny little timber project but uh, the kind of hard shell tectonic interior that um you know i was sort of thinking of that project while i was doing this and um that same sort of presence of the the platonic form timber clad platonic form kind of flush exterior tectonic interior set within a landscape um the building with the the sort of snow condition um oh, suddenly yeah, becomes a, in the veranda. becomes a different scale yeah yeah beautiful Opening party, it's pretty amazing um, time. You can sort of see that scale of the veranda. Mm. It's, it's different to what you might expect. Yeah, I was kind of, I was really, that was like the one thing I was really worried about during the construction process. I was like, gee, that was, it's one of those moments. Yeah. But then, um, <laughs> you, you know, and like too tall. Yeah, I was worried it was just like, just out of scale and like quite a tall building that, that you wouldn't even register the sort of rake of the roof. But yeah. Um, that's gorgeous. It lends right. it a really beautiful civic quality. Yeah, elevate absolutely. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question, isn't it? How like a civic quality can come through into architecture, yeah. um, into into all building types. Um, it's the neighbor Gombe um, performing karaoke at the opening. There's an airplane flying over you, Andrew. That must be like the only airplane in the sky in Sydney for the last two weeks. <laughs> I've actually, I'm in, in Marrickville and I've, I've actually heard, heard a couple um, the past few days. It's like, yeah. Um, a community meeting happening the night before the opening. Um, so, it's a, yeah, it's a community building used by the local community as well as artists and residents. Mm -hmm. 
The next project very quickly, it's sort of, I guess, in terms of these kind of earlier projects that were very simple forms that then set up, um, yeah, apparently simple forms that have, hold a, a kind of level of complexity is the Crescent House, which was designed for um, Sherman Contemporary Art Foundation, um, which is now SCCI, it's its new iteration, Sherman Centre for Culture and Ideas. Um, and, you know, Jean Sherman's a great, um, been a great client, we've done some other work for, for her. Um, and a great patron of architecture, mm. I think. Um, it's an amazing service. Like this was initially installed in Paddington and, and has now been installed permanently at, at Heidi down in Melbourne. Um, the aspiration in the initial brief was to engage a wide audience with architectural thought, uh, which is a fairly open sort of proposition. So I thought, um, you know, the thing I was thinking about at that time was this idea of the the simple, like this, the sort of intensely simple form, but that was actually incredibly site specific. Um, so try to hold that tension together. Um, I wanted to do something that a that both a, a you know a non architect sort of visitor could come in, um, see and kind of read the intent and read what it was trying to do, um, but that also an, an architect, a sort of knowing audience could also gain uh, another a sort of an, another level of. Um, experience from so it's this simple box form it had to be 20 square meters to comply to be complying development so i thought okay 20 square meters five by four let's make a rectangular box um a sort of sculptural subtraction carving these two arcs the idea being that the two arcs would would then overlap so you'd create this kind of infinitely sharp point that was sort of built into the geometry and i thought that would create a threshold that might charge their sense of experience into moving into that space which then looked onto this rose apple hedge. So I wanted to kind of create this kind of intensified condition of experiencing the ordinary landscape of the rose apple hedge. It's actually a beautiful hedge, um, but it's finite. But to try to imbue, use a device of framing to imbue the imbue the finite with a sense of um, yeah additional value, or um, you know we frame things that we that we value, so we can kind of imbue a sense of yeah. A value or vastness into the finite landscape. Uh, it was, I was kind of interested to sort of test that whether, you know, it's a nice idea and it sounds like one of those things that, okay, then you make it and you know see, like is that actually, is that actually going to really translate? But it was then this. Um, there were some site specific conditions here. You approached it from a veranda, so you came up from a higher level and stepped down. So you looked at it from above. The elevation with the top of it was very important. There was this forecourt, um, which we wanted to use it as a sort of an event space. So I thought, let's paint, let's do a, a kind of grid, set it out as a grid, but then plant, um, there's actually Lamandra at every, at sort of random spacing. So that, so it was apparently just a field of planting, but that you could then set up an event and you might be sitting in your seat next to a plant. Uh, there were a few of those, it was really, it was really good. They really worked. Um, <laughs> um, and there, there was a, a step down in the courtyard, about 600 mil, um, these timber sleepers. So we had to sort of deal with that level change condition, which I saw as an opportunity to create a level, just a level condition. Um, the construction drawing, so you sort of get a sense of this, this fine kind of edge. Um, uh, aluminium plate screen, which kind of conceals the sense of entry and this secondary kind of moment um, where uh, you, you have this second seat adjacent, adjacent to the side wall. Um, so it, I thought it might be a space that you might not even you might not even visit. You'd only experience it if you walked walked around the building. The sort of the wings extend out beyond it. I didn't want it just to be a truncated box with a kind of hole cut in. I wanted them to read as kind of walls and plane of roof. The top of the building, that sort of top facade, is very important. So we had, I, I wanted to make it not read like a roof, but like a timber box. So again, taking it more to a kind of object quality as opposed to a, a building, uh, all those kind of associations. So the, the timber decking over the top, and then you have this kind of roof that carries over, little steel plate roof to kind of create a fine edge there. Mm -hmm. um, it's this kind of, yeah, so the sort of thing of kind of knowing detailing that, that wall extending through, this stopping short, so there's this sense of being held in that edge feeling in the kind of negative of these sleepers with more sleepers um, and then creating this very kind of fine threshold. Um, you know, we wanted to, we had a timber sophia and a timber deck coming to a point. So we needed to use a, we sort of used 
I think it was LVLs, we cut them at an angle. Um, actually, Arab did the structural engineering on this. Um, and we used a kind of a steel flashing, which we folded just to create rigidity at that edge condition, mm -hmm. um, whilst also sort of flashing down onto the waterproof membrane. Mm -hmm. um, then in plan, you get these kind of details, just again, dealing with those various conditions. So from above, you do get this this reading, um, you know, that thing of like a, you know, an architect will visit that and realize that something good, there's something sort of sophisticated going on in the detailing, yeah. this kind of absolute thinness meeting this absolute thinness. And the, uh, the sort of field of planting. The Lamandra. The Lamandra. Got them from Bunnings. <laughs> Probably. Um, yeah, and then the sort of screen, and then the fact that the screen has some perforation um, and the kind of play of like the robust kind of quality of the timber versus the thinness of the screen. The screen made in three pieces because that's what the fabricator could do. Then the screen gets brings light through to the onto the surface. We sort of reinforce this edge of that 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 um, point with a with a piece of aluminium just to kind of give some stiffness there. But but kind of light coming through onto the darker surface. Just a, a sort of atmospheric mm. space. The court the gravel of the actually black holds colour very nicely. Um, you know the gravel of the courtyard being held into the black of this wall. The green of the rose apple hedge being held into the other into the sea. Then that just device of framing, the kind of proximity of this wall coming, this this wall coming in close proximity to the hedge, meant there's a kind of uniform wash of light down the wall, down the hedge. So you're kind of controlling that condition. Um, then I guess the other ways that light is kind of controlled, and um, you know, not intentionally, but just precise geometry has that kind of quality. That's one thing. These kind of crisply, crisply delineated forms with a geometric clarity will. We'll do things with light. Um, I did a, yeah, did a doing a review at the moment of the edition office memorial in Canberra, um, yeah. which I think this building had a, a sort of lineage maybe from this mm. in, in a few things, a few yeah, ways. Probably. But um, I think that's a beautiful project, and um, you see, I see all you see all those the things that we just dis I discovered in this um, about like yeah the way that geometry could hold other. Um, could create very precise lighting conditions. You see that happening down there. It's really great. Yeah, it is incredible. Um, and Andrew, the the, um, the holes in the screen are they random, or is there a pattern to them, or what? What? How did they come about? They they were more just um, naively. I thought I wanted to create um, uh, something with a sense of a starry night. Um, so that's just not naive. That's yeah, good. that's beautiful. Well, it was simple. It was simple. I probably, I'd probably drill down and engage. That's the kind of question that I engage more now. I, like, I want to get more kind of layering into that. Mm. Um, anyway, um, and the little space around the corner. Yeah. This is, this is actually this is a photograph um, installed at Heidi. It's got that kind of absolute flatness, but it it's in the kind of garden condition there. I wanted to set it down the down at the the sort of bottom edge of the court of the landscape um and you, you lose here um so we had to create a level a level change to, to get that thresh that flush threshold happening yeah. um but you lose the you lose the presence of the roof so the kind of com complexity of the readings is changed it's like i realized with this project the site specific quality you don't think it's site specific but it's kind of it is intensely site specific so it was yeah. it was quite a challenge to then relocate it yeah um, the next next project, I guess, just stepping up a little bit in not so much scale but complexity. Um, project the Hyde Park Cafe, which we've been doing for the City of Sydney. We actually started this project five years ago, and uh, had two two children since then. <laughs> um, the joys so, of civic building procurement. Absolutely, absolutely. But we. Um, yeah, myself and really Camille um, in the office, who's um, has done a great set of construction documentation, design development, really resolved it well, um, gave the building its precision, um, and now we're we're nearing completion. Um, also working with with Casey and and Jonathan Donnelly um, on the project in the past, and we city projects. I think need to 
give a nod to. Um, you know, the project, um, the design managers at the City of Sydney, I think, are really fantastic. Um, and they make you do your best work um, through an exhaustive process, but it's what it does. It's like it's a public thing, so we're going to get the best out of it, um, which is the way this worked. It's located in Hyde Park down at the southern end on this corner. Um, so Hyde Park was this more kind of informal condition, which then Norman Weeks won a competition to redesign it. He defined this sort of central, this sort of nodal, circular nodal geometry, um, formalise the desire lines, um, create the archboard fountain. That, that was the sort of vision that formed Hyde Park. Um, so that site, the, the railway was then built through there. So um, our site was built above a live railway, which is obviously a, Fairly challenging design case um, to deal with. Lots of technical issues to resolve. Mm. Uh, this is the railway when it was filled up, so you can see when it when it when it, when it had been backfilled, so you can see that effectively, you know, uh, this is built. I mean, you don't have there weren't tunnel boring machines, and it was mm. all open cut mm. construction to build these things. Um, so you open up this new landscape. The building is an L-shaped building, actually tilted about 45 degrees to the grid of the city, so it sort of faces the corner. Then I think quite fortuitously sends off this other wing, to, so it becomes this kind of L-shape open to the north, protecting you from the southern winds that come up Elizabeth Street. Mm -hmm. um, it's a photograph from the 30s. I think it's, I mean, it feels like it could be, it's like Lithgow or something. Yeah. You know, it doesn't feel like a, doesn't feel, <laughs> it's like it's, it's that era of the development of the city. Um, we wanted to respond to the, the, the elements of the existing building. So the, um, the, the sort of chunky awning, um, brick is the primary material, sandstone is the secondary material, wanting to translate that, translate the thickness of the, the charcoal awning through to a, a fine roof and take the secondary structure of the sandstone through to the, pro to become the primary structure of the new building. Um, you may recognize there was a legacy actually uh, built a cafe in the 60s on the site it has that kind of arched roof so legacy it's this it's lately you know, legacy is an organization of poor returned yeah. servicemen yeah. and women yeah. so the association with the war memorial just up the hill mm -hmm. um, was the link um, and so this was the condition that we were mm. dealing with when we started the project um, you know the signage is kind of fun but um, mm. then there was this sort of Probably not the most sensitive response to the heritage building. Um, <laughs> oh, come on, Andrew. It takes the arch as a window in the brickwork. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. True. True. Actually, I hadn't, hadn't, hadn't seen that, but I don't tend to see arches. Um, <laughs> we, we did this sort of montage early on just to show that through kind of doing a lower-lying building, we could pick up another view, another level of the Downing Centre. Yeah. Um, Actually, I realize, I've realized now actually that this level, the, the detailing of that building changes. It's actually, it, it kind of progresses down. There's another layer of um, this corbling. Yeah. Anyway, we weren't to know. Um, our first response was to sort of respond to the no circular nodal geometry at that park as a sort of circular landscape moment and then locate a circle, truncate it with the L shape of the heritage building, drop a skylight between the two. Um, we took that to the design advisory panel and they said, Nice design, looking good, but we think that you should follow the established logic of this park, which is where all the buildings are rectilinear and the park is nodal. So the, so um, yeah, right. you know the the, the nodal the, the the landscape the circular geometry is limited to the to the landscape element, mm -hmm. um, whereas our building is this kind of intensely rectilinear thing. So they said we want you to develop something which is a rectilinear response. Um, so we did this very. <laughs> You know, it's one of those moments where it's like, okay, um, that's like, let's begin again. Um, but I don't know. It's like a privilege to work in a yeah. in a city, and when you realise, like, yeah, it was like Kerry Claire and Ken Marr and um, these, you know, hugely respected characters who have this role as custod as custodians. Um, and yeah, like if. Like I think there is something nice about falling in behind the accepted principles of a 
um, city that's kind of a part of that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we did this square thing, kind of square roof. Um, we created a new link through that wasn't part of our brief. So I thought it was an opportunity to create a new connection through. So these two arches through in the, into the heritage building lobby, we, you get a new view through to the memorial and a new link through and a new sort of space where the cafe can wrap around that we cloak the lift, um, cafe front of house, back of house services, cafe WC, park WC, bin store. And then coming through from the way that link will work, um, then wanting to sort of present this super fine roof, like again, the kind of idea of a kind of institutional quality, but then destabilizing that with a, a very, uh, this sort of super fine roof. It's not sort of doing kind of symmetry and balance. Uh, it's, it's kind of trying to do an upset thing. It's like, it's not, not a very, in a way, it's not a very pleasing kind of resolution to have a super thin thing and then a very chunky kind of truncated thing. Um, but then seeing, you know, seeing how it's it's coming to life. That we're about a month off completion until handover for the cafe operator. Um, uh, contract destructus has been working very hard. Um, you can see, I mean, you can see the intent. I guess I, I thought with this project, so much of it will be approached from a lower level, you know, from down on Elizabeth Street. Yeah. So that was an opportunity to kind of lose the presence of the structure with a tapered edge on the roof um, and to yeah so so it was kind of this quite dramatic cant there it's like six meters on the diagonal um but with no sense of structural depth um so again it's it's like the sherman pavilion the 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 reading from above is so important to that the reading from below the kind of experiential reading is very important to this um you can see the skylight that breaks between the two buildings so it is very much this pavilion um and the kind of reading from the the from across Elizabeth Street, the the thickness of the awning contrasting, the kind of critical alignments all sort of observed, all the kind of coursing matches in the is translated into the sandstone. It's quite a nice collection from that view of those boxes, like they're three three mm. objects. It's quite beautiful. First we wanted to align this, um, Zedge, but <laughs> in the end we felt we felt quite comfortable. Um, mm. we needed to expand to kind of get more back of house area, um, to get some back of house area. Um, but I thought, yeah, in the end, it's just, it's like a collection. There's like a logic, there's already a logic of this kind of shifting form in the mm. heritage building. And then we kind of extend that. And it moves and away from the street. Out. It sets out a little bit and pokes out from behind. It's nice, sweet. Absolutely. Um, all the kind of doors and things will all be sort of flush panels. The signage are kind of substituted sandstone panels. Um, there's a whole, there's a whole layer of, um, yeah, sort of small moments that are yet to come. And so then you do get direct commission or a competition this one? It was an EOI. Um, so EOI then limited down to five way tender. Mm -hmm. um, competitive fee. Nice. Um, we didn't put forward a scheme at that stage because we thought that's not what the project's about. We, we just put forward some observations. Um, and some thoughts about how we might approach it. Um, the structure is built above a, a rail line and a station. So Kevin, we worked with Kevin from SDA, um, who we've done so many so many projects with over the years. Um, and so he we had to do a GPS survey to pick up all the column points down below. Um, and so as to locate transfer that node directly down. There was another another issue that he had thought was very, I thought was very smart. He, he did a calculation of what the existing weight of the building was, and also, also all the soil and backfill that was there. And we just made sure that our new building was lighter than that. Nice. Um, that that took away a whole lot of complexity in the sort of structural rationalization. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a, it was like a smart sort of strategy. And then Kevin's kind of detailing this kind of box section on its side or around the structural gutter to create that fine edge, then the roof shedding kind of shrouds and tapers over. We get an upstand here to collect the water. Um, Someone just asked on the, on the, on the um, feed about the detail, and that's a beautiful detail. It was, um, it's all pre-cant, the, the steel's all pre-cambered, you know, so as the fabricator explained to me, he, 
he gets he always gets the structure engineers the structure engineer will do a calculation of the amount of the pre camber you know you've got to put 20 meters over six and a half meters 20 millimeters over six and a half meters into it or whatever and he he says he always does 60 percent of whatever the structure engineers tell him because he he knows that he thinks it doesn't never sags as much as you think it's going to <laughs> and you the eye always wants it wants to wants it to sag a little more like the eye all it always wants yeah. to be we want to, we're happy seeing a sag like where our eyes are adjusted to that yeah. But what we really don't like seeing is where it goes kind of up. Uh, <laughs> you can yeah. imagine. Yeah. You don't want to see a kind of excess kind of pre cambered thing. Yeah. So it's kind of knowledge that these people have. Yeah, um, the kind of verticality, again, that vertical proportion. We didn't want to do like a primary and secondary structure. We just wanted to do a bunch of these 100 by 50s that would conceal the window framing behind them. And you get this verticality of that view through to the sort of vertical lines of the memorial. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Richard Johnson's. JPW's recent project, I think. This is this is like to me, this is like next level in terms of civic architecture of it's like invisible, you know, it's invisible and in it's authorship. Um, but it is so you know utterly skillful and it's you know it's subservient to the original vision of Bruce Dellett. Um, but it's um, yeah, just a great skillful reinterpretation. Yeah. It's like it's such a bit. Absolutely. Um, and the simple form. So you can see that shifting of volumes. Um, conscious of time, or what, what are we going to? Quarter past? Yeah. Okay. Sure. See There's how far we go. 381 people on, on, so they're, they're still interested, Andrew. It's good. <laughs> when the numbers stop dropping, we start really when they start dropping, dropping down. I'll tell you, they kind of finish it up. <laughs> people, people have a beer or. Um, something. Um, so I guess a, another step up in scale and trying to take some of those concerns forward. Um, Cranbrook School. Um, yeah, I had a, a, it was a great team working on that as well. Um, Noel, who I think is watching, sent me a message. I haven't responded. Sorry, Noel. Um, the project is in the Wagon Valley, which is out sort of northwest from Sydney. Beautiful landscape. It's um, there. The fire went through the valley. Um, Right through the valley, but no buildings were lost in the entire Walden Valley. Wow. The site were the, were is. The trees kept? The um, Wallamai Pines? Uh, they saved them, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, but this. Yeah, we had, we had um, yeah, big asset protection zones. The, the site manager actually left protecting his own house to come to protect the site. Which is pretty amazing um, service, you know. Mm. The, the Crown Book are really kind of impressed. Well, grateful for that, obviously. Um, so you kind of come in, come in on this road, and it kind of winds around, and then we have this kind of bowl form. Um, I won't go through all of this, but only to say the starting thing. This was an invited comp, mm. and in the brief was a the headmaster Nick Sampson had written a letter from the perspective of a year eight boy. Who just finished his first his his, his first visit to Wagon Valley? So that was a really beautiful, empathetic gesture. Mm. Um, you know, the the leadership of a school to demonstrate an understanding of what they're really hoping. Um, you know, their boys will gain from this experience. So we thought that kind of experiential focus was very important. So we, rather than sort of communicate a full scheme, we just communicated a vision of um, experience, the kind of experiential quality. So there's kind of series of vignettes. Um, that just sort of chart the boy's first day at Walgan. You know, so he kind of comes up, he comes through this wall, this kind of bowl of the valley unfolds. Um, he goes into the main main lodge space and sort of the the roof rises up and he sees it's kind of held, um, the, the cliffs fill the room. He can look around to his um, common room. Um, he gets to his his own bedroom and he has that, sen- that sense of the small scale within this larger site at your own space kind of spaces, structures within the trees. Um, the kitchen becoming a kind of collaborative space, veget- revegetation moment. So trying to sort of show all the sort of aspirations of the project in a series of renders. Um, you know, art making spaces connect to the landscape. Boys sent shooting Morse code across to each other. Um, um, a James Terrell moment. Um, this kind of open air observatory um, and the idea of what we call rituals of stewardship where each 
there'll be a bunch of sort of responsibilities that people have, such as, you know, the, the, the fires in these buildings to get hot water, you need to light a fire, you've got a wet back heating system. So, you know, one boy will be responsible for the group um, every day. So you're kind of, other people's comfort is relying upon you. So it's kind of building responsibility to others. Um, you know, reflective moments that go in are running into the chapel. We sort of wanted to respond to that bowl of the landscape with a, a sort of arcing geometry um, in the architecture. So it's this simple kind of grouping of buildings, a kind of splayed end conditions, um, a series of sort of point, upward sort of pointing buildings on the inside face and then the low ones on the outside face, the main lodge in the center, symmetrical, um, sort of elaborated thresholds, the rendering the road in and then the one of the first we built three of the buildings so far um be a long project i think happened over i don't know 15 years or something um but yeah we built three and i guess this this idea of a sort of abstracted rural form um chimney corbels trying to get a kind of close coloration of all the, the various elements set under the uh escarpment Got the Andrew and you can, veranda again. Definitely got the veranda. Love it. We've been punching out a few of those, I have to <laughs> say. <laughs> um, but you can see just these simple geometries start to turn the corner in our timber interior. Beautiful. Someone's just said, told me um, who else was on the competition. You, you, um, you beat a few uh, fairly large names there, Andrew. We did, actually. There was... Uh, yeah. Starch and Laplastia and that's BB true. Hand and Casey Brown. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, there were a few. There were a few. Uh, it was a good one. Good happy one to get. Very happy day. I think I, I got the phone call. I was driving through Newtown. I pulled over and went to Messina. <laughs> <laughs> Simple, simple kind of portal forms. The the kitchen building, again, it's just super direct. The kind of articulate, simply articulated veranda. But they can also absorb a solid condition at a storeroom. Mm -hmm. The kind of sweep you can see the kind of the, the other edge of the, the the landscape, and this sort of flows down to this pizza oven, the huge pizza oven, um, and this table, long table, thirty five meters long, the full cohort, hundred students and thirty staff can sit out on this long table, site-specific table, follows the curve and steps down the hill wow. with this awning structure that you can pull out. Um, so we have been um, yeah, doing a few more of these uh, abstracted rural forms. This is a rural residential development we're doing at the moment, um, going to council shortly. Um, and Life of village down the morning to peninsula, sort of one of the earlier concepts, which was very much just about this. Yeah, again, another level of abstraction. You know, embed the embed the gutter into the into the roof system, carry the roofing on the other side, have collect most of the water, but still present the thin edge. Uh, um, three cage track. Um, I guess continuing um, some of these ideas. A larger structure again, a different set of challenges. Um, so project down in Tasmania, hi to Helen. Um, um, located on the Tasman Peninsula. Um, two sites, Surveyors Cove and Munro. Tasmania, the client was the Tasmanian walking company. Ken Latona was the founder. Um, he started the company um, to try to create a way of uh, creating opportunities for people to visit Tassie's extraordinary landscapes. This was his Bay of Fires Lodge. He was an architect. He is an architect. Um, fantastic building, I think. This simple. I, lo I always love the kind of outrigger. There's no, um, there are no no rafters that project out that edge. Of the, it's that sort of triangulated thing. The roof sheeting combined with the outrigger edge mm. supports that sort of triangulates that edge. The roof sheeting is its own provides its own thickness. So we wanted to do that same thing. Um, this was his plan. Actually, a really beautifully resolved plan. Bedroom pavilions, li living pavilions. Then our building, one of our buildings, we kind of sort of wanted to break it apart a little bit more, but the same kind of DNA is there, um, the kind of linear arrangement. The view is in this direction. 
we didn't want to sort of guzzle the view. We wanted to just present a very fine aperture to the view and then the room sort of break apart. So there's more of a sense of immersion in the landscape. These other little pavilions peel off on the diagonal. The second site's a more complex configuration. There's a kind of grouping around this courtyard. It doesn't really read that way in this plan, but it's, it does feel that, it certainly feels that way. All constructed with helicopter. Um, this is a kind of Sim City moment. Uh -huh. um, you know, walking to the site. So, so it's, this is a series of hiking lodges. Um, Such beautiful, beautiful landscapes. But it, it is. It's amazing. I mean, you have to go. People haven't been down there. It's a great walk to do. Um, there's the parks huts as well, and then the, the Tasmanian Walking Company huts. But it's a great spot. These photo, all these photos, basically every photograph in this presentation is by Brett Boardman. Um, you know, the building is kind of cloaked in the landscape. You kind of arrive and you come at this light, up at this large stair. You come to a solid wall. This idea that you might get the kind of dramatic reveal um, of the landscape. This kind of room that opens right through. Had this idea that the guides, one guide would peel ahead, come and open that, that far set of doors, bring all the walkers up onto the veranda, so you kind of lost the view, then then do the dramatic reveal. Mm. It becomes a space of, you know, gathering. Um, then you get that, yeah, sublime coastline. The roof, so you can see sort of the, you can see the kind of non, no, no rafter detail. Yeah, no, These the, can the support 1.6 meters. The camera turn the detail, absolutely. Again, that thing, I guess, of a sort of institutional presence, the kind of forecourt within the landscape. You can see it here. I think of some of Rick Laplastri is like the Bruni Island house, that kind of gathering around a space and kind of roofs that tilt back away from that. Um, so this is really doing that. You know, the early reef edges all kind of kicked off the sort of play of flush glass that that then translates around to the sort of steel plate detail that holds the doors that simple kind of set, setting adjacent to the escarpment, kind of clustering and you get these, you do get these views back across to the second, towards the second site, which is kind of over these ridges, which is this building. Um, again, a cloaked series of walkways, spat and stained, multiple shades. It's sort of the circulation space steps down here, you get that repetition. Um, the way it steps down, you open up these views through to Cape Rao, Crescent Bay. Rather than having a linear, having a wide frontage to the view, we wanted a, a narrow frontage and the, and the wide aperture to the Im immediate landscape, the 10 meter clear span. Um, that meant you could, we needed a balustrade on one side, but then you open across, you can just step onto the rocks on the other. So that kind of setting it to the hill, looking across at that landscape presented to you as um, almost as image. Mm. A small room down below that kind of opens up on the corner. And the simple accommodation, actually a flush glass, a fixed glass panel with a solid opening panel at the side, which just helps with bushfire. Straightforward section detail is kind of elaborated door. I'll, I'll show quickly, very quickly, three more projects that are more showing, I guess, some more, I guess, more experimental direction, two competitions and one large project that we're um, progressing with at the moment. So this was a competition for Barilla, the pasta maker. Um, they wanted to do a, so it's in Palma, their industrial site. I think something that, so the thing that I've become interested in is, is trying to hold together uh, two concepts and rather than a kind of singular, I think if you hold together two concepts and then try to reconcile that, I think it's a, it's a technique that can solve complex design problems where there are, if you can pull apart the layers of complexity of the design problem, address those with a clear explicit concept to each one, then reintegrate them, it can create a unique form that you would not have come up with a, with, with, with a singular gesture. Um, this is sort of towards that idea, I guess. Um, this project was all about food and what food might mean and the, the spectrum of what how we how we experience food. So the Ban Ki Moon quote about food security and the AA Gill quote about the pleasure of food, you know, the feeling that you'll be replete and feel warm and safe, the promise of food. Like the idea of the winding path, so the kind of in terms of pleasure um, and reveal and discovery. There was also this thing of the geometry of industry on this site um, that you might have a 
um, the, the, their campus, that sort of rectilinear geometry. We wanted to sort of resolve, integrate these two into a complex form. Like, you know, you would never draw that. Um, <laughs> I certainly would <laughs> draw those, the kind of path and the, uh, this is not a great project, but it's a, it's like a, it's like an experiment. You know, so it sort of observes all the alignments, the rectilinear buildings respond to all the adjacent conditions. It's part of that set, but then it's also part of the pathway system. And the pathway, it's not like pathway and then and then space that kind of it's just like a continuity. Um, you know, Walhurt and Bose, the Louisiana Museum. The, the idea of tables like the long table at Walgan Valley stretching through. Simple plan. That you get this kind of ambiguous space between circulation and then programmatic space that was kind of all a continuity second competition very quickly a uh, competition for a, a library in Korea um, which we submitted recently Cheongju um, yeah massive push from um, Jordan Khan and Ethan in the office among others um, set in a city condition we thought to create something which had a laneway condition built into it, but was also a strong object. So to try to do two things again, so the kind of object presence, but also a field, the object and field at the same time. Um, yeah, large central stair, biasing that geometry. Quite interested in these kind of potato shapes, multiple arcs that kind of respond. Like it's not a circle; it's like a responsive to the geometries of its con. You can solve problems through the way you kind of push and pull the edges. Tried it on a few projects. I'm, I'm going to get try to get one of these things built one day. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, hence this, hence hence showing it tonight. But this idea of this kind of filigree roof that brings distributes light, the kind of rectilinear through the roof and the rounded exterior. Then is a differentiator. It's like multiple, kind of multiple buildings with different treatments, but also the one thing. Um, you know the plan resolution. The, kind of the facade becomes opportunities for signage. The roof, the sawtooth of the roof relates to the serrations of the facade. That absolute flatness of the geometry, but this rounded presence in plan sort of reminded me of um, our Green Square Aquatic Centre proposal from a few years ago. Mm. The sort of rounded sort of serrations, just trying to have like a, a, a two bands where one it's doing one thing here and then it's doing another thing here just through sort of again using steel plate to kind of hold different conditions um sitting within the landscape and then giving way to a more rectilinear interior existing building that was retained that presence that it, that from different locations again the simple apparently simple object but presents in it as a very much a solid from certain orientations and the last project, very quickly, is um, McAvoy Street, which is a design excellence competition that we won last year. We've been sort of working extremely hard on this for the last um, 10 months. Um, I know Dimitri um, in the office, we've been yeah, absolutely pushing this thing for what seems like a very long time, as I'm sure you're familiar with in these projects, Adam, um, located in Alexandria. Sites here very much at the threshold between a conservation area and an industrial estate. It's a really fantastic site condition to suddenly deal with. We did a fine grain study for the government architects office a few years ago. This is for Sydenham station and, and this idea of like the promise of industrial buildings. Um, something that um, you know, it's a fairly obvious architectural form, but they in a way that a kind of natural landscape has its own set of conditions and rules. It's almost like part of the ecology of this place. They kind of have an authenticity mm -hmm. that's arisen from their, their absolute directness. Yeah. Um, so a simple geometry, which is this kind of stack of gridded forms with a, another a, a, a grouping of smaller metallic objects above. Quite interested in this idea of like a simultaneous urbanism, a kind of a, when you look at this is, this is Commonwealth Street, um, and the that sort of just the grouping, the reality of grouping of multiple buildings, strong built forms that form a city. Um, um, then the Alexandria Canal, this photograph from I think the 40s. Um, you yeah, know, this is this is these these forms that just are truncated following that um, the sweep of the river. 
stage one DA sort of adopted this geometry. We wanted to sort of flip it to to have a rectilinear geometry across the site. So you can sort of see our response to try to create three three apparently three buildings with sort of variation in brick detailing. This sort of layer of carefully art of articulated as, as smaller objects sitting above. So sort of resonating with that sawtooth expression. Different kind of play of um, you know, hit and miss brickwork, implied grids on the sides, um, palisades, part palisades, cuttings. Um, so quite one of the most exciting things on this is, um, so Jamie North has been successful in the Public Art Commission. Um, it's the photograph he took in Ultima. Um, this idea, this is kind of this simple observation that's quite essential, I think, to his practice, which is about these plants that will grow um, in you know in the urban condition it's like it's like one it's like one of those moments it's like a small idea that has like has big consequence and you can read layers and layers into it um so he is this is just a sort of early early kind of image um but that, that on the sort of cut, entry cuts to the building which happen on both the buildings on, on both frontages he's kind of, kind of we're kind of going to, going to a kind of erode this form and ero we're actually going to ero erode holes into it so you can get access to maintain um, the watering system and and then um, have these integrated art moments. Mm. Courtyard space. I think and I, I think that that's 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 an example of something where I think like a singular approach could could become so much more interesting through much earlier kind of layering of the of the art concept to mm. sort of inform you know programmatic elements or whatever it might be. Courtyard space, very much a garden-esque aesthetic. Um, we did the competition with Chris Owen, fantastic designer. Yep. On the rear laneway, the second street is the more the suburb, the, the heritage context condition. So we wanted to break it into smaller modules. Didn't really want to use the. I thought that the sawtooth form was too. Uh, this in, in, the association was too strong. The industrial association. I also thought that a. A gable was too cute, so we sort of found this asymmetrical gable form sitting between the two, um, which gives us this sort of expression. So you can see the larger building behind, but the smaller, the the heritage context. Um, the plan is working pretty hard, but um, we thought the possibility was, I mean, a T-shaped plan is super hard to plan, so we thought just lose that space, make a avoiding the center open to the side so you have these sort of bridges that enable you to circulate to the rooms um i guess um to try to heighten that experience that it's like it's like this is this is the most special architectural moment the most special architectural moment in this project is not essential um and but it solves the problem of a complex of a challenging site like that um so that's awesome. my last, yeah. That was awesome, man. I guess um, yeah. No, I mean, no, no great conclusion, but I guess to say, um, increasing scale and complexity, awareness of potential to move beyond a strategy of the, the sort of ambiguous object to larger grouped kind of aggregated forms, um, with more readings of their place and collaboration. Yeah. Do you want to um, just unshare your screen so we can see you, see your face? Mm. So I think it'd be nice to have you, have you on, because I can't show me, because uh, for some reason my computer won't let me see me, which is fine. <laughs> is, there, is, there still anyone, is there still anyone watching? We've still had 333 people, so you've done quite well, wow. even though we started so Thanks, everyone. Ooh, Thanks, great. everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Yeah. Um, where there's a, there's a lot of questions to come, but I think um, given the fact we started late, um, we've had a bit of a conversation throughout it, so I don't feel yep. the need to ask too many questions. Um, but you know, I think it's amazing work, just really gorgeous. It's always joyful to see something you're doing. So thank you, Andrew. It's also Thanks, fantastic. Um, we have some news from the bookshop tonight. Um, which I'll just get Andrew off the screen so he's, he's not seen. <laughs> um, which is a bit of a sad news, actually. Um, 
after two years, we're closing the bookshop. Unfortunately, um, ah. given the uh, given the challenge that we've got at the moment with uh, the coronavirus, but really long ongoing challenges with running a bookshop, we're going to close the bookshop. So this last day open is going to be on the twentieth of June. We're going to have um, still be trading online. So if anyone wants to buy some books up until then, uh, we know lots of people have got book vouchers. So jump on. We want you to use those um, because we've got lots of great books. But we want to give you a lot of everyone as much notice as we can because we want to make sure that um, you can come and enjoy the last little bit of the bookshop. Um, for me, it's been amazing having the bookshop. It's just a challenge to run a practice and run a bookshop. So it's kind of part of the reason is to kind of get back into making the things that I want to make, which is architecture. Um, but we do want to thank um, the staff, particularly Anne, who ran the shop, and Mary, and Tom, and Ali, and Nick, and Noah. It's been amazing kind of work in the shop but uh, yeah so anyway we're going to close the book but that's that's okay that happens but we've still got the um, the isolation talks so we've got a couple more of those to go uh, next week is Jeremy McLeod um, and Philip Vivian so Jeremy from Breathe Architecture and Nightingale in Melbourne and Philip Vivian from Bates Martin Sydney and Philip's going to Jeremy's going to talk about actual um, built projects Philip's going to talk about propositions about the city which I think would be really great but Andrew, thank yeah. you. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Love having you. Love seeing your work. It's also always fantastic. Pleasure. Also great. But thanks, everyone. Um, and we will see you all. Thanks, Adam. Thanks.